What's up Money Tribe? Welcome back to another discussion video and today we are talking about one of the most controversial subjects that probably could ever be discussed here on the channel. So as you guys know we already have a problem with uh, the Moon Boys as they are uh, called here on the channel but there is another thing that Dave and I have a fundamentally huge problem with and that is day trading. So this is going to be a pretty controversial video. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about and unpack. So uh, Davi, where, where do we start with this? Because there is so much to unpack. I mean, I've got some strong opinions on day trading. I know you've certainly got some strong opinions. And uh, maybe we can start with why do we hate day trading so much? Well, first, because it's just way too much stress. Why do you want to live with that kind of stress? I've, I've seen day traders in, in like while they are busy um, trading, you know, and it's just it just doesn't stop. They're glued to their phone. They always watch the phone. They're always stressed. Stress. It looks like they always got to stick up their ass because, well, they are trading with a lot of money and they've got basically seconds for it. Is you know, basically where they can lose their money, you know. So that's the first thing. Second thing is a most most day traders are just not successful. Most of the people just lose money hand over fist. There are a very few small number of people that are successful at it, but those people do it at full time. You know, there's no side hustling day trading. The people that are generally successful at day trading is the people that are doing it full time and not just doing it three, two, three, four hours a day. So, I mean, I've got some friends that are really successful at day trading. They are exceptional at what they do. They are chart readers. They trade on the technicals. They've told me outright they understand that fundamentals have no impact in their, in their decision making. And it is purely based on, you know, following the candlestick, so to speak. But they also talk about the fact that they have to take huge risk exposure for very small margin in order to make consistent income. So this is something a lot of retail investors don't know. And I think the other thing that is really significant is the official, the unofficial, should I say, statistic about day traders is 78% of first time day traders will lose all of their money. The other scary statistic is that 42% of them will return once again to try and trade again and 90% of those second time traders will lose all of their money once again. These are official statistics that are publicly available and so the problem I have with day trading beyond simply the numbers is that it's touted by all of these gurus and you know all of these charters and technical guys saying that and telling everybody they can make money and honestly nothing could be further from the truth. There is a small amount of people that really make a lot of money out of this, but the vast majority of people are losing money. Like the ads on YouTube, I just keep getting them. I'm getting so sick and tired of it. What if I can tell you that I've got a brand new system, a trading system <laughs> that can double your money within a week? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, and, and so because it's such a great system, you're selling it. I mean, if it was that great, you'd be using it yourself ultimately, right? No, you know, if, if you can be doubling your money in a week, I mean, if you take simple logic like compound interest and do simple maths, you would never have to work in your life again. <laughs> but unfortunately, this logic evades the average person. So, Davi, there's a clip that we came across. It's a five minute clip. I really want to play it here on the channel. It speaks to everything we believe about investing. It speaks to every principle that we adhere to. It talks about the exact problem. And it is from probably one of the most respected people in the investment community. And that is, of course, Charlie Munger. So I'm going to bring that up on screen. And uh, let's listen through this clip. And then I think there's quite a bit to, to break down here because there is a lot of stuff that is very relevant, especially if we look at the last year with the Moon Boys. I mean, everybody telling us that, I mean, it's, it's so crazy, Darby. People come to the stock videos and they go, look, it went up 12%, you were wrong. Or look, it went down 5%, you were wrong. Oh, and I had this dude as well on my video of Amazon. It's down 12% since you, since you posted it. Like, Seriously? I mean, what are you doing here? And, and that's my point, right? So there's a disconnect between day trading and investing, but Let's be very clear, we, we are pretty much against day trading. We don't believe it's good for the average investor. Uh, certainly there are people who can make money out of it, but you know, it, it isn't our wheelhouse, it isn't our area of expertise. We're very open about it. I have tried day trading before. I lost my shirt several times over. It's not my wheelhouse. So let's take a look at this clip quickly. So I just wanna quickly give a big props up uh, to uh, Free Investing. You can go and check out their YouTube channel. They put this out, really good little video. Um, and obviously, uh, I think there's some really pertinent, pertinent points here. If you take the modern world where people are trying to teach you 
how to come in and trade actively in stocks. Well, I regard that as roughly equivalent to trying to induce a bunch of young people to start off on heroin. It is really stupid. And when you're already rich, to make your money by encouraging people to get rich by trading. And then there are people on the TV, another wonderful place. And they say, I have this book that will teach you how to make 300% a year. <laughs> All you have to do is pay for shipping. And I will mail it to you. How likely is it that a person who had suddenly found a way to make 300% a year would be trying to sell books on the internet <laughs> to you? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. And yet, I've described modern commerce. And the people who do this all day think they're useful citizens. The advertising agents <laughs> invent the lingo. And so in insurance, they say, well, they say, the two people who shifted from Geico to the Glotz Insurance Company saved $400 each. What they don't tell you is there are only two such people in the whole United States. <laughs> And they were both nuts. <laughs> but they mislead you on purpose. And, and I get tired of it. And I, I don't think it's right that we deliberately mislead people as much as we do. Let me tell you another story that I think is an interesting one about the modern life. But this goes back to a different time. And this man has this wonderful horse. And it's just a marvelous horse. It's got an easy gait. And, good looking and everything it just works wonderfully but also occasionally just gets so he's dangerous and vicious and causes enormous damage and trouble and breaks arms and legs for his rider and so on and he goes to the vet and say what can i do about this horse and the vet says that's a very easy problem and i'm glad to help you he says, what should i do and the man says the next time your horse is behaving well sell it <laughs> Well, think of how immoral that is. And haven't I just described what private equity has to do? <laughs> when private equity has to sell something that's really troublesome, they hire an investment banker. And what does the investment banker do? He makes a projection. You can't, I, I have never seen such expertise in my whole life as is created in making projections in investment banking. There is no business so lousy it can't get a wonderful projection. <laughs> and, but is that a great way to make a living, to have phony projections and use it to make money out of people you look right into the eyes of? I would say no. And by and large, Warren and I, we never tried to make money out of dumb, say, out of stupidity of our dumb buyers. We tried to make money by buying. And if we were selling horse shit, we didn't want to pretend it was a cure for arthritis. And, <laughs> and, and, and I think it's better to go through life our way instead of theirs. I think it's always been this way. I think there's always been chicanery. Think of the carnivals of the carny operator. Think how much trickery there is in a carny operation. And people just, seek out the weaknesses of their fellow man and take advantage. And you have to get wise enough so you, you avoid them all. And you can't avoid them if they're in your family. I have no solution to that one. <laughs> but, but where you have a fair choice, there are just so many people that should be avoided. My father had this best friend and client, and he also had this other client who was a big blowhard. And and he was always working for the big blowhard, and he wasn't ever working for his wonderful client whom I admired. And I said, why do you do this? And he said, Charlie, you idiot. He says, the big blowhard is an endless source of legal troubles. He's all, always in trouble, overreaching and misbehaving and so forth. Where he says, Grant McFadden treats everybody right, the employees, the customers, everything. He gets involved with some psychotic, he walks over there and makes a graceful exit immediately. So a man like that doesn't need a lawyer. And my father was trying to teach me something and it really worked. I spent my whole life trying to be like Grant McFadden. And I want to tell you, it works. It really works. 
Peter Coffin is always telling me if the crooks only knew how much money you could make by being honest, they'd <laughs> all behave differently. Warren has a wonderful saying I like. He says, you take the high road, it's never crowded. You can't. Now, I mean, isn't that just like, it is just like the perfect way to explain why we feel the way we do about day trading, the way we feel about these stock picking systems, the way we feel about all these like stupid finance gurus who are making out as if they've got some secret source. There's no secret source to this thing, right? Investing is about consistency. It's about time. It's about compounding. It's about making and patience. sure you, and patience and making sure you're buying companies that are fundamentally worth something. There is no secret here. It's just logic, right? And yet, we are made to look like the pariahs and guys like us, because there are other channels like this as well. We're made to, to seem like the pariahs because we're not talking about the opportunity to 10x or 20x your money in the same year. People who are talking about you know, companies who have no fundamental value, who is, they're essentially selling horseshit, as Charlie Munger says, right? And pretending it's a cure for arthritis. The reality of it is, Davi, it is actually disgusting the level of crookery and thievery that is going on the world over. And, and I, think that's, I think that's where there's an opportunity. And we've spoken about this privately so many times. We're not going to tell people what they want to hear. We're going to tell people what they, what they need to hear. And if that means we've got a smaller audience, I'm okay with that. Yes, look, I mean, there are many options out there to 10x your money, 20x your money, but it comes with enormous risk as well. And I think we've started to see that now in the last correction, you know, in the last uh, six months or so, there's been a, a massive sell off. Most of these growth stocks, which has been funded by a lot of the YouTube channels, you know, to 10x your money, this has got 100x, that's got 1000x. Well, most of them are down about 90, 80 to 90 percent, you know. Yeah. There's not a day that goes by these days, or this, this last week, really, where I review a stock where it's not down a considerable amount. And usually the safe stocks, well, they are down like the Amazons. Amazon's down 12%, right? Yeah. But then I re review all of these other stocks, like these growth stocks or, or um, big potential or innovative stocks, that's down like 90%, you know? And that's the difference between a quality company and a shit company is, yes, there, are, there will always be volatility in, 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 in stocks, you know? It doesn't mean that if a company is a good, stable company, that it's not gonna drop in share price, you know? I mean, the market, like Charlie Munger and them always say, it's a, it's a voting machine in the short term and a weighing machine in the long term. Yeah. And so, and so when there's pressure in the markets, you will see volatility. But the quality companies tend to have less risk and they usually decline much less than these growth stocks. You know, look at these growth stocks. They're down between 60, 70, 80, 90%. So, so Davi, a lot of day traders will argue, but we know that. We, we know that. We know they shit companies. We know they've got no fundamentals. It doesn't matter. We're simply trading the graph. We're simply trading the technicals. What is your what what is your reply to that? Well, I want to pose something different, you know. So, what was the point of the whole short squeeze thing? It was actually in the, in the beginning, Wall Street bets, it was to stick it to the hedge funds, right? And then all of these moon boys climbed in and they also said, "Well, the purpose behind it is to stick it to the hedge funds, you know. We want to beat the system at it." But all they are doing is they are buying a shit stock, they are trying to pump the price, and then they are leaving their fellow mate there holding the bag. And that is immoral. That is exactly what the hedge funds are doing. Now, if you're arguing that you got into it to beat the system, well, you're doing exactly the same as them, and it is immoral at the end of the day, if you think about it, because you're doing exactly the same thing, and you are scamming your fellow mate or your fellow uh, person when it comes to that investment. That person probably also deserves to be scammed, but... Um, that's just the way it is, you know, and I, I bet very few people actually think about it that way. And I, and I kind of feel exactly the same way about cryptocurrency, exactly what you've just said, you know. Everybody's recruiting each other to cryptocurrency and let's get into Bitcoin together and let's get into this together. And, you know, I mean, there's even these seminars doing the rounds where it's like, I got into Bitcoin or cryptocurrency because I might, wanted to make a difference in the world and I wanted to help people make money. But fundamentally, people... People need to understand that it is a giant freaking pyramid scheme. I mean, if you put your money in and, you, and we all put our money in, the price goes up. If we all take our money out, the price goes down. It, isn't, it hasn't got any real world utility. It doesn't make a profit. It doesn't do something functional in the world. And I think this is the same argument we have with these high growth stocks. I mean, you're talking about a high growth stock, right? that has made zero money, that has got no fundamentals, unproven management, and it gets a market cap of a couple of billion dollars. And the question then is, 
What is the real value? The real value is actually perceived value. So as long as we're all pumping the perception, the price is going to go up. The moment perception buggers off, well, the price goes down. And the difference between that and a, and a company that has real value, if the market cap goes up because everybody perceives it to be a value, there's still fundamental value. If the, if the market cap drops because everybody perceives that it's not a crap company, fundamentally the business is still the same business and that's what we want to get people to understand we want to get people to understand that you must stop buying the market cap stop buying you know purely based on perception buy the underlying business and yet the funny thing is Davi, if we take every single person who's been buying these meme stocks over the last years or maybe maybe not everyone but the vast majority of them and we say to them please take a couple hundred thousand dollars out of your savings and let's go buy a business they're going to scrutinize that business like you've never seen. But yet, when they go and buy a stock, they never, they never scrutinize the stock. If the things are making money, they don't care. No, well, it's absolutely insane. I mean, let, let, let's talk about Netflix, what happened there yesterday. You know, at some point, all of the, all, everyone wanted to own Netflix when it was 550, you know. And then obviously Netflix dropped, what I think it's more than about 28% or more. But... The, the price stayed stable for one or two days. Then Bill Ackman yesterday came out saying he, he took a position of 1.1 million in, um, in, in Netflix. Now, obviously, Bill Ackman is very well known, but all of a sudden, Netflix stock goes up by 7%. Now, I, I assume those people haven't re even checked the fundamentals. They probably just heard, well, Bill Ackman bought it, so now I must buy it. It's just completely irrational. I don't understand how, how, how these people think, you know. They spend more time choosing the bread they want to eat in the shop that they actually choose on a stock. Net. So spending time on a stock for trying to figure out what the fundamentals are. They just read something on Twitter, or on stock tweets, and all of a sudden, well, this has got a 10x, this has got a 100x, I must buy it. And then they climb all in, and then they start buying. Well, I was watching a video that was put up by uh, Ray Dalio the other day, um, and he was talking about the impact of retail investment, how it's changed the investment landscape. I mean, any person with access to a mobile phone now and an app, be it Robinhood, eToro, whatever, you know, we buy, buy stocks or whatever it is, right? Can go on there and within a split second, buy into a stock and sell out of a stock. And whilst that convenience has brought about massive opportunity, it's also brought about massive risk because people are not doing mm -hmm. their due diligence when buying a stock. And so this is why I think it's important to understand that you actually need to be your own barrier to entry. So I just want to talk about Netflix quickly because by the way, again, I might be, ca might be called out for flip-flopping here, but I put out a video saying I felt Netflix was a sell. I had very specific reasons for it. I felt that the debt-to-equity ratio was in an uncomfortable level for me. I felt that there were certain aspects of the business, like their declining, um, their declining margins um, potentially in the future, uh, is something that was a level of concern for me. But the pricing fell to a point, by the way, at that 28% mark where suddenly the stock started to make sense for me again. And I think this is what people need to understand. You and I might be a buyer or sell on something today, but when the data changes, we will change our decision accordingly. But the one thing we don't ever change our decision-making process on is that the company is actually fundamentally worth something. There is profit, there are customers, it is producing something of value, and we perceive that at least in the next 10 years, the business is still gonna be around. So, you know, I've, I actually went and purchased a big chunk of Netflix stock, actually just before the whole book, uh, Bill Ackman thing came out. So my portfolio, oh, is, yeah, my portfolio is thankfully looking yeah, very I good. I was sitting and contemplating, debating with myself, should I buy, should I not? And then it just took too long and well, the price went up already, but it's still down significantly from what, where I thought was, was fair value, you know, but once again, for me, there are a few better options than that. Well, That's from where well. you so, looked at the, at the price, it's 50% down almost from the last time you checked, it was $600 range when I looked at that video you put out. Um, yes. and, and, you know, it's kind of like Microsoft. I missed Microsoft this week at 278. I landed up averaging in at 284.90 was my average buy-in. Now, am I, am I upset that I didn't get it at the $278 range? Of course I'm upset, right? But do I believe that Microsoft's gonna be worth infinitely more than $300 in five or 10 years time? Of course I do. And you'd be a fool not to believe that. A lot of things would have to go wrong for Microsoft not to, to, to continue growing. So, you know, I think this is what people need to understand when you're doing fundamental analysis. As the data changes, we have to make updated decisions. And uh, the one thing we just unanimously agree on between you and I is that 
the fundamentals is the most important metric. So, you know, if you're looking at fundamentals, that is the ultimate metric, right? No, of course. So, we um, of maybe I want to just include a little bit of additional content here. And I, and I don't know if you can maybe pull up the uh, Elon Musk uh, tweet this week on, um, on uh, McDonald's, which has obviously been doing the rounds a little bit. So I think we'll we'll maybe touch on that a little bit as well, because yeah, we, we were talking about our cryptocurrency holdings the other day, and you and I both, uh, we're definitely not the biggest fans of crypto at this moment in time. And I think you and I both fundamentally, fundamentally believe in the future of the blockchain, but we feel that cryptocurrency is exceptionally volatile. And again, I think that it's a giant freaking pyramid scheme at this point. That being said, do I think it's going to be cryptocurrency as a concept will be around in the future? Absolutely. Do I think it's going to be Bitcoin? Do I think it's going to be Dogecoin? Nobody knows. And anybody who thinks they have the answer, I think is wrong. But there is a reason why I'm staying in Doge. And I think there's probably a reason why you're also staying in Doge. And let's be clear, it is a speculation, right, Davi? We are speculating. Oh, here. definitely. Definitely, it's, definitely. It's nothing more. It's nothing less. It is speculation. So let's talk about what happened here quickly. So Elon put out this tweet. Uh, let me see if I can increase this. Yeah. I will eat a happy meal on TV if McDonald's accepts Dogecoin. Obviously, McDonald's comes out with their own reply and only if Tesla accepts Coin. And you know what's the craziest thing of all? Someone actually took that opportunity and they immediately created Coin. That thing surged in price. You will I not believe it, it. I knew it would. I knew it would. So, so listen, I've got, to say, I've got to give big props to Elon Musk, a uh, clever marketing boy. Uh, he, there's one thing he knows how to do, and that's how to grab attention. I mean, if he wasn't going to be successful at business, he certainly was going to be very successful at uh, politics because he knows how to get attention. But I've got to tell you, that was probably a very, very piss poor uh, decision by McDonald's. In fact, McDonald's could have been a lot clever, and I would have put three burgers in his mouth. And, uh, and accepts a Doge, because that would have been a fantastic free marketing stunt for McDonald's. I think they missed a big opportunity well, there. Well, yes and no, because imagine the kind of investment that has to go into actually getting Dogecoin accepted on the McDonald's pay, uh, payment systems. That must be a complete number. It must cost them billions. And like we've seen as well, McDonald's already has negative equity. So um, I don't think that's an investment they would want to take on right now. I don't think it will actually... Um, justify that kind of marketing. So let's talk about why you're staying in Doge at this moment. Why haven't you sold out? The price is tanking. Why haven't you sold out? So I've done a few videos on Tesla. I've been very bearish on Tesla in the beginning and they've just continued to surprise me. And um, I've been studying Elon Musk a lot and what I've learned as well is you just never bet against the dude. I mean, he just keeps surprising you. I mean, it was the most shorted stock at one stage and now it's um, one of the most successful, you know. The guy's also very famous for just amazing knowledge, you know, and he just doesn't stop learning. And when he says he's going to take on a project, usually he follows through as well. And well, he's got some some uh, plans with Dogecoin, you know. I mean, he's been continually talking about it. I'm sure he said that he wants to get involved into the development team. We know that he employs only the best. He talks to only the best. So, and the guy's a marketing genius. So I think there's definitely something behind the scenes that we don't know about. And for that reason, and the other last reason is that I don't like selling at a loss. You know, you only lose when you sell. So I'm sitting with that Dogecoin in my wallet, but I'm trying to, I, I wish I could just transfer it to my Econ, my, my um, eToro e-wallet or wallet, what do you call it? But unfortunately I can't. So unfortunately it is still with- What if it goes to zero? Well, then it goes to zero. It's something I knew it could happen. It's a risk I'm willing to take. and. Come on, 1,800 is definitely not gonna make me poor. So, so, here, so here's the thing, right? I'm, I've, I've continued to stay in Doge for one very simple reason. I, I, I am probably, I'm probably almost on the edge of a little bit of an Elon Musk fanboy, but at the same time, I really don't like the dude. I know it's a very complex sort of like relationship I'm explaining here, but I, I, I love the way he looks at things. I love the way he translates uh, his thoughts into actions, the way he builds teams around him. There's a lot of things I really don't like. I don't like some of the stuff that he's done over the course of the last year with crypto and the way he's really toyed with people's emotions and really just got tongue, tongues wagging and markets moving. I think he's done some very irre see, irresponsible things, he, but Darby... He have relaxed a bit though. Eh? He, he has. And by the way, I'm convinced he's part of the lizard people, which is a discussion for another day. But uh, I think that... Uh, 
I think that betting against Elon Musk is, is, is proving to be consistently a bad idea for people. And so I, I've been delving deep into minutes of meetings that he's held with some of the investment people around him for the last you know, 15 years, uh, like ex-business partners. And there's one common thread amongst everybody. They all say the same thing. Never bet against Elon Musk. And, uh, you know, I think that's been proven time and time again already. So, you know, I, I just for that reason, I'm happy to keep my speculation at play for a while longer. You know, I was I was saying earlier in the I just can't wait to get rid of it. But actually now I'm a little bit curious. I don't know how to explain this, but I'm just a little bit curious. And like you said, the amount of Doge we hold, I mean, it's 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 really not going to make a difference in, in the world. Ah, but uh, it is an irritation looking at those numbers every day, to be honest with you. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, think, I think marketing genius for sure. And I'm very, by the way, you know, a lot of people when we came out and said we're so negative against Tesla and, you know, we gave Tesla such a bad rap and we probably feel like idiots for not investing now. I make a, I make a simple point. I still feel that Tesla is actually overvalued. Very simply, I think people are prepared to pay very high multiples for, for the future growth of the company and future opportunity. Having said that, I have a similar relationship, but on a flip, a sort of a flip-sided relationship than I have with Meta. Meta, I love the freaking stock. I hate the company, right? And so with Tesla, I love the company. I love the brand. I love everything, but I hate the stock. And uh, the stock still just doesn't make enough sense for me. And have I lost opportunity in that? Of course I have. Could I, could I have made a lot of money on it? Yes, I could have. But then if I was investing in Tesla, I would have invested in a lot of other similar stocks because that would have been my mindset. And then I would have one success with Tesla and 98 other failures. And that's, of course, the problem we talk about, right? No, exactly. You know, it's, a, it's the kind of risk you want to take on. And like we've said a few times on the channel already, you know, it, it comes down to the individual. And if you don't want to take that risk, then you don't have to take that risk. I mean, there are other opportunities that you might find better, you know. Just because we don't want to invest in a stock doesn't mean no one should invest in that stock, you know. So a lot of people did very well with Tesla, and I congratulate them. But I, I don't regret it at all because it was my decision. It's my responsibility, you know. I wasn't willing to take that risk, and um, I'm still not willing to take the risk. And that's why I'm not investing in it. I couldn't agree more. So guys, um, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, discussion. Let us know in the comment section down below if there's any other subjects you'd like us to debate or even just drop us links with some interesting videos and stuff because Darby and I spend a lot of time reading over content, consuming content. And of course, we want to bring that to our audience here. And uh, we think that these discussions are invaluable, not just for you guys, but for us personally. We really enjoy discussing and debating these things. And uh, as always, if uh, you would like to see some more content like this, you can check out some of the playlists off the homepage of the channel. Alternatively, you can check out some of the videos coming up on your screen shortly.